Well, good morning, everybody. I would like to thank you so much for joining us today from the, with the Placer County Master Gardeners. We are going to be presenting a workshop on composting and mulching. Um, our presentation will be recorded and will be available for you to look at again on our YouTube channel, which is Placer County MGs. Um, you can uh, ask your questions via the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of our presentation, we will be answering those questions for you. Um, now I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Kathy Netto will be talking about composting and Becky Fritchie will be sharing the importance of mulching. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brooke. Hi, good morning and welcome to Composting Basics. My name is Kathy Netto and I have been a master gardener for 11 years. And I have been composting for more years than I want to let people know about. But let's get started on our adventure today in composting. Who, just who are our master gardeners? Master gardeners are volunteers, and we have been trained through the University of California. We extend researched sustainable gardening information. We present accurate and impartial information to home gardeners. And we encourage the public to make informed gardening decisions. And where to find us? We have a great hotline that's operated by a number of master gardeners. You can call in and submit questions. We have a fabulous website. You can find us on social media, in the local newspapers, our quarterly news newsletter called The Curious Gardener. And of course, you can find us in our garden guide and calendar, which is still available. We have a few left online, but you can also find them at a number of local retailers in Placer, El Dorado, and Nevada counties. Okay, let's talk about why we should compost. By com composting, we can divert organic matter from the landfill. And did you know that Americans put 140 million tons of waste into our landfills each year? And by eliminating the organic matter from the landfills, we can take and prevent methane gas pollution and leachates, which can pollute our groundwaters. And backyard composting helps us to make compost at home and reduce our carbon footprint by not having to have a truck come and pick that up. And compost, when we use it in our yards, helps to increase the organic matter in our soil, which is excellent. The residents of Placer County do need to, to compost. And this is the most current information I could get from our waste management company. Placer residents waste disposal, 213,000 tons of trash is thrown away. Did you know that that's about one pound per day per resident? And Placer County is growing, especially in the Roseville area. So we need to pile that up. Compost happens. Compost is just a natural thing that happens. Everything composts and breaks down. And Felder Rushing, who was a composting guru, had two rules. One, stop throwing that stuff away. And two, pile it up somewhere so it can decompose. So let's go ahead and we'll go from garbage to garden. The composting process, all of these components that are listed here are all a part of what makes composting happen. And let's go ahead and take a closer look at each of them. The first one we're gonna look at is called nitrogen or your greens. Nitrogen is needed to get the composition process started and keep your pile cooking and hot. Examples of your greens can be vegetable and fruit scraps, grass clippings, coffee grounds, manures, and alfalfa hay. But don't let the color fool you because as we all know, coffee grounds and manures generally are brown. Now we need 
browns. Browns are like the carbohydrates. They, the bacteria and the microbes need the browns for the energy to keep working and decomposing. And usually these are low moisture content, dry things like dry leaves. And right now we sure do have a lot of those. Straw, sawdust from natural resources like natural hardwoods, wood chips, corn stalks, and of course, cardboard and newspaper are great sources of browns if you don't have a lot of leaves. When you're building your pile, there's some things that we want to put into our pile. Here's what you can add. You can put in your grass clippings, yard waste. When you've trimmed your shrubs or trimmed your plants, put that in your compost bin. You can put leaves in there, including oak leaves. Yes, that is fine. Pine needles can go in, but pine needles can be a little bit waxy. So you may want to run them over with the mower or chop them up with your weed eater before adding those to the compost bin. You can put in vegetable trimmings when you're cooking. You, we peel things and stuff. All of that is great for the bin. Food scraps can go into the bin. Eggshells are great. Recommend crushing them up a little bit to help prevent things like skunks from digging in after them. Um, wood chips, shred it up, newspaper, newsprint. Just avoid magazines that have the slick cover on that because that is a chemical process on there. So we want to avoid those. And of course, sawdust in small amounts. But then again, we do have some things that we do not want to go in our piles. Disease infected plants and plants with severe insect attack should not go into our compost pile. Even if you're doing hot composting, it's not going to get hot enough to take care of the disease and plants with insects. Those we really do encourage you to put into the green waste and allow that to go to a commercial facility where it can get hot enough, where it's ground up and it can be processed. By putting it in our home bin, sometimes we run the risk of reinfecting our gardens with some of these things. Things like ivy, morning gory, and succulents, things that um, reproduce from a cutting should not go into the compost bin. Things like succulents especially. You put succulents in there and the next thing you know, you've got a whole bunch of new best friends. Certain weeds should not go in a compost bin, especially Bermuda grass. We know how hard it is to get rid of that. Things like oxalis and cheeseweed just do not decompose well in a home bin. So send that on to the green waste. We want to avoid um, composting cat and dog manures. Cat and dog manures can contain pathogens and then you would not want to use those around, especially edibles. We want to avoid putting meat, dairy, and fish scraps in, including any oils and fats. The meat and dairy, while well, things will decompose, these will just continue to create a problem like odors and attract critters that we really do not want in our bins. Things like raccoons and dogs and things like that that can get in there. Um, also, wood ash. We want to avoid putting wood ash in the compost bin. Research has found out that at the time when you're mixing it in, there's a chemical process that happens when you put wood ash in your compost. For some reason, it turns it very alkaline and lye. So we want to avoid putting it in that, but you still can use those wood ashes. You can mix a little bit with your completed compost and then use that on your plants. Let's make our pile. There's important considerations to think of. We should have a pile that's at least three by three by three, no smaller, because that's the size that you need for the microbial action to get things heated up. And you really don't want anything bigger than five by five by five. That's really big. And after that, it just becomes a mess. Um, you need to think about, when you're getting ready to do this. Do you have a whole bunch of stuff that you're ready to compost? You know, you're gonna make one big batch 
or are you just an occasional composter where you're going to put a few things in at a time? Have you chopped your materials? Chopping materials increases their likelihood that they will compost faster. We've increased the surface area that the microbes can get to. So chopping up the materials into small bits will help. Um, it's not always necessary. Um, important is moisture and aeration. We want to keep our bins damp, like a wrung out sponge, not wet. And we want to aerate them by turning them and bringing the center to the outside and this outside to the center to keep it going. We want air. And for composting, you don't need a lot of fancy tools. A good spading fork, which has the wider tines on it, I have found been a great way to get in and turn your bin. Um, I have not had good luck with things like hay forks and pitchforks. All that seems to do is stab stuff and it sticks on the ends of the tines. They also do make a commercial compost aerator. It's a long pole and when you push it down in, it has these little wings on it that pop out. And then when you pull it out, it kind of pulls the compost and it kind of brings it up and around. But you don't need anything fancy to do composting. Choosing a system. When you go to choose a system, what is your goal for composting? Let's set a goal. Um, are you an avid gardener that gardens year round? Or are you just an occasional gardener? Somebody that gardens year round is gonna need a lot of compost. Are you gonna want and need a lot of compost for your yard? Or do you have, a, you just only need a small amount. You have a very small yard, you wanna recycle. And so you don't need a lot of compost. So before you decide, What's your goal? And along with setting a goal is deciding what kind of bin do you want? You know, your bin is also going to depend on the size of your yard. For example, this big three bin here, you're, this takes up a lot of area. It's a great tool for those of us that are making a lot of compost. And I make a lot of compost because I garden year round and I have raised beds and containers and stuff that I'm constantly filling. So I use a three bin system. You may want something smaller like this one here. This is called the earth machine. It has a little door at the bottom that you can open and you can take your compost out once things are starting to decompose because once it starts breaking down, the bottom is where the compost is going to be. Or you may want to have something free. You don't have to spend tons of money. You can build things out of pallets or wire. You don't even really need a bin. But if you have dogs, you're going to want a bin because they love to dig in that. Um, they also have these tumblers. And I've used one exactly like this, and it's not my favorite, but they do work. They do make compost. Um, I found that they either are really dry or really wet. And once you get enough stuff in there, they are extremely heavy to turn. And you have to watch this handle here. Once you're turning it and it's full and you stop, it sometimes has a tendency to snap back on you but it's up to you and it's your personal preference of what you would want to do. But remember, you don't need to spend a ton of money to do composting. So let's talk about hot composting. This is where you have a ton of material ready. Um, you may have horses and you may have other animals and you have a lot of material and you're going to create one batch, one three by three by three batch of compost. Um, you want to make sure that when you're doing this, you have equal amounts by volume. So we like to talk about this and think about it as five gallon buckets. So you take one five gallon bucket and you have all your green material and it's completely full. You know, that's kind of wet and heavy. Then you have another five gallon bucket you put your browns in it, but browns are light and airy. 
And so you're going to have all these air pockets in there and you're not going to have equal amounts by volume. So what you need to do is you take that five gallon bucket and you really smash it down in there until it's completely full. Then you have your equal volumes. You're going through, you build your pile, watering the pile as you are building it because those brown materials need to be damp as you are building that pile up. You want to keep your pile moist, just moist, like a wet wring out sponge. When you touch it, it should just feel damp. You want to keep it aerobic, which means turning it weekly. Hot composting is an investment in time. So you need to be out there. You need to be turning it. You need to be taking its temperature so that you can keep it at about 140 degrees. And they, yes, they do make a compost thermometer. It looks like a, a meat thermometer with a really long probe on it. So we turn it, we check its temperature, we're out there, it takes constant monitoring. And you've made one pile and you're not adding anything to it. But you're saying, what if I have extra material? Well, then you can have an extra, another compost bin that you add stuff to, but that's for another discussion. So you want to do this, but you can get compost in this method in about eight weeks, maybe. You know, a lot of it's gonna depend on the size of your material, how damp it is, how much you've turned it, and also temperature. You know, right now it's getting kind of cold and those microbes are not as interested in working as hard. So that's hot composting. Let's talk about the composting that a lot of backyard gardeners do. And that's the cold static method. We add things as they become available. We have a little container maybe in our kitchen. We put all of our potato peels and carrots and things like that for, that we are ready to take out. We take and we put it in the compost bin. We're adding as we go, we're building as we go. But Avoid what we call the dump and run. I'm married to Mr. Dump and Run. Dump and run is where you go out, you dump the compost and you run really fast back into the house because it's cold outside or it's wild outside and you don't want to get, you don't want to be outside. Remember, when you're dumping, you want to make sure that you keep that equal volume of greens and browns. And you may even want to have out by your compost bin, you know, maybe a bag of leaves or some shredded paper or something that's brown that you can put into the compost bin along with all those kitchen scraps to keep that balanced. You also want to make sure you're keeping your kitchen scraps covered, you know, burying it in a hole into the middle of your bed, covering it up. By covering it, you're going to run you're not going to run the risk of getting maggots and things in there that are unpleasant and other things that would you know want to come along like raccoons. So keep it covered, avoid dump and run, and keep it balanced. When we add too many greens to our compost bin, we're out there and we're just adding kitchen scraps and yard things and things like that where you've got it. What happens when you have too many greens in there, it's going to become a stinky, slimy mess. And you're, you're not gonna like it and your neighbors are not gonna like it. So keep it balanced. Also, if you have just too many browns, you just have a pile of leaves, they're not gonna do anything. They're just gonna kind of sit there. And then when they dry out, it's gonna become a house for snakes and rodents. Snakes, it doesn't matter because they're beneficial, but it can become a home for rats and mice and things that we really don't want. So remember, equal amounts by volume, keep it moist like a wrung out sponge and give it a turn every now and then. Easy peasy. And if something happens, um, you can go to our website. We have a great troubleshooting paper that you can go through and it'll help you work through some of the things. So let's move on. How long does it take? We talked about that. Moisture. We want to make sure that it, things are cut up small. 
Are you providing active or passive aeration? Active aeration is when you're out there with the fork and you're turning it and you're tipping it or whatever you're using, you're mixing your pile, whether it's weekly, every other week, you're out there, you're turning it and mixing it. Or you're doing passive aeration, which means you have it in a container where the air is just flowing in from the side. You're getting some air. You may have some bigger pieces in there that are allowing air pockets to form. Also, how hot our pile gets. A hot pile maintained will decompose faster than a cold static pile. And what you're putting into the pile, the particle size, chopping things up smaller will decompose faster. And we do need to take in seasonal considerations. In the winter, things just slow down a little bit. And we get a lot, now we're starting to get into that rainy season. You may wanna keep your bin covered with, you know, a tarp or a piece of wood or something so that it doesn't get soggy in the rain. What's happening is it gets wet, it gets soggy and the water runs through and out and there go all your nutrients. So in the winter time, try to keep it covered so it doesn't get too wet. In the summertime, you may wanna keep it covered or in the shade so that it doesn't dry out too fast. By drying out too fast, the composting process will stop. So keep it covered and no, you do not need to have it in the direct sun. Have it in the shade, tuck it away. By having it in the shade, it will slow down that drying out process in the summertime. So now we know it's gonna depend on how long. And when you're doing the cold static method, it could take six months to a year to get compost, but that's okay. You're doing something and it's gonna start forming at the bottom. So if you had, you have one with a little door, you can look up, you can start to see that in the bottom. So let's move along. You know, compost process, there also involves some critters. We've talked about our organic matter and our greens and our browns. Well, we need to talk about some friends that come to the bin. We're gonna start with the macroorganisms, the big guys, the ones that we see. And you know, things like ants and centipedes and beetles and worms and even earwigs. All of these are decomposers. So if you open it up and you're turning it and you see, oh my gosh, I've got earwigs. Don't worry about it. They're a decomposer. Roly polies in your bin, they're a decomposer. They all are helping to break things down. And this will make it a little clearer. When we have a compost pile, think of it as a city or an ecosystem. And you have beetles and you have centipedes and you have all of these things there. And those things are feeding on all the smaller things like your springtails and your mites. And those things are feeding on the actinomycetes and the fungus and the bacteria. And everything depends on each other. If somebody's always eating someone and somebody's always pooping. So you've got this whole structure going on inside the compost bin. So don't worry. Where you would worry is if you started seeing things like a lot of flies or you, it was really dry and it becomes an anthill, then that becomes a problem. But don't worry if you see a few of these in there, it's a part of the process. The microorganisms, these are our powerhouses. These are what make the compost bin get hot. They break down the plant material and they create carbon dioxide and heat in there. And under the right conditions, your bacteria can double every hour. Bacteria, we get, you know, bacteria. Bacteria is necessary. Bacteria and fungus are necessary decomposers. Now, when we get to the part where our compost is done and you say, but Kathy, how do I know when my compost is done? It is when everything is broken down so that you can't tell what it is. You can't tell that that's a banana peel or that's an apple core. It should look nice and rich and brown and have this wonderful earthy smell. 
to it. So it's un, you can't recognize the stuff that you put in it. Also, the temperature will cool. You'll not be able to bring the temperature back up and get it hot again. It's going to continue to cool. And what I do um, with mine is I sift my compost because I know I'm going to have bigger pieces in there. So I sift it out. I take my good stuff, I put it in a separate bin, usually a garbage can, and I let it kind of age and mellow out a little bit. And all the big things that are there, usually it's like twigs or peach pits or nuts, things like that. I'll go ahead and I'll put back into the bin to add to the next pile. So we're going to reuse those, or if you want to, you can always use them as a mulch. So now we've harvested our compost, we've let it age, and it's beautiful. Now remember, compost should not smell. It shouldn't have a funky smell. It should smell pleasant, like damp earth. I know, I'm silly. But it should have a good smell to it. And you're saying, okay, now I've got all this nice compost. What do I do with it? Well, here's what we can do. You can take and you can incorporate compost into your beds, especially vegetable gardens. They're grown as an annual and they're in that bed such a short amount of time. We want to mix that compost down about three to four inches. We want that right at the root zone so that those roots can take up those nutrients into the plant. We can also top dress with it which is around your perennial plants like trees and shrubs and even some of your perennial container plants, adding a layer on top of that. You don't have to mix that in because the microbes and the worms and everything is gonna kind of start bringing those nutrients down to the root of the trees. We're not in a hurry because those plants will be there a while. Um, Container mixes. If you're growing a lot in containers, you know that you need to use potting soil and certain potting soils do not have a lot of organic matter. So it's okay to take some of that compost and mix it in with your potting soil to add some organic matter and some nutrients into that. And you can use it as a top dress in your um, potted perennials in between the times that you take them out and you're doing repotting. Add a nice layer to the top of that and it'll kind of help keep those plants healthy. The next thing is what we call an extract or I'm going to use a general term as a tea, but we don't, as master gardeners, we don't do tea. Tea is brewing something and that's not what we do because there's not been enough field and peer studies on that. So we talk about an extract. You can take a bucket and this is great if you only have a little bit. So you're only getting a little bit like this person has here in this picture in their hand. You can take that, put it in a bucket of water, you know, mix it around, get it stirred up, get the microbes going and stuff. And you can use that to water your plants and you know, the compost can come out. You're gonna get a bigger bang for your buck with just a little bit of compost by doing an extract. So now that we have finished talking compost, we're gonna get ready to talk about mulch. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Becky. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful, beautiful Friday morning. My name is Becky Fritchie, and I have been a master gardener since 2015. And Kathy and I like talking about mulching along with composting because they seem to go hand in hand. Composting, you're enriching the soil, you're adding those nutrients, and then you're using the mulch to protect the soil, to keep what you, all that hard work that you've done to enrich your soil you want to keep it in place. So when you think about mulching, I want you to think about the last time you were in a forest. When you think about forests, there's nobody there with leaf blowers. There's nobody there with rakes. You're walking through, everything is lush and it smells earthy. That's mother nature mulching. So what is mulch? Mulch can be 
bark chips. It can be leaves, like in leave it. Um, I, I use shredded bark. It could be um, rubber mulch. It could be rocks and gravel, uh, rice straw, all that kind of good stuff. Um, the large bark is kind of nice uh, on hillsides and things like that. If you do the rice straw, keep in mind, don't buy hay because hay has seeds and you don't want those little seeds to sprout all over the place. Rocks and gravel, I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Now the pine needles, there's a resin in pine needles, which makes it very flammable. So I do suggest that you put that in your compost pile instead of using it as a mulch. Rubber bark, because it's a petroleum based product is highly flammable. It's made from old tires. I know they use it a lot in playgrounds and things like that, but it, it, it doesn't break down. It doesn't add any nutrients to your soil. And I mean, who wants their yard to smell like tires, right? Uh, the composted wood chips, you can get a lot of those free. If you hear the tree trimmers in your neighborhood, they don't wanna take those, those chips back to their facility. A lot of times they will at free dump those in your driveway for you to use. The mulch is really cool because it does suppress your weeds. It conserves moisture. A matter of fact, studies have shown that it can, set, um, it can reduce your evaporation by 50%. During the summer, your mulch can keep your soil cooler. During the winter, it can keep your soil warmer. It can prevent compaction. And with the rainy season coming up, this is fairly important because rain, as it's hitting the ground, does compact your soil. Along, like with my house, I've got two large dogs. My soil is horrible. Uh, it can control erosion. And then the best part about mulch is it's inviting the worms. It's, 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 the worms are gonna aerate and, and just add all this good stuff to your, to your soil. So as it says on the bottom of the slide, nature does not like bare soil. Either you cover with mulch or it's gonna be covered with weeds. Oh, one other thing, when we go back, I just remembered about the inviting the worms. Um, I live in the Roseville area and here there's a lot of new construction going on where they've graded the, the, the dirt so much that it is, it's just dirt. It's that silty dirt where nothing's gonna really grow. One teaspoon of dirt has 50 microbes in it. By creating this healthy soil, as Kathy was talking about with composting and things, one teaspoon of healthy soil has 8 billion microbes. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? Okay, when you're applying the mulch, you don't want it up against the stems of your plants. So like the like example here in the picture of the tulips, you wanna keep the mulch about three inches to six inches away from your plants. Um, you wanna keep it away from the trunks. You wanna keep it away from the, your buildings. And that's because the mulch holds moisture and you don't wanna cause any kind of rot. When you've got close planting, close plant spacing, you want to keep the mulch fairly thin, two to four inches. But if you've got an open area, you want it about six inches because again, you're trying to suppress the weeds. During the summer, if you're using mulch, keep it fairly moist. Um, I water my mulch when I water my plants. And that's because of the microbes and the worms down below, you want to keep them fairly moist. And it helps with the decomposition of the mulch. When we get the rain, you don't have to worry about watering, um, which is coming up. This is the perfect time to be mulching. It's the, they do recommend that you add new mulch yearly to keep up the depth. I use Gorilla Hair, which is the shredded bark. Um, it, it doesn't decompose real fast. So I only, oh, probably replace my mulch maybe about every three years. Right now with the trees losing all their leaves, it's a good idea just to mow those over and you can leave them in place as mulch or, or mow them over and then just put them around your plants. Uh, leaves provide wonderful nutrients. Okay, rocks. I wanna talk about rocks. When you think about rocks, rocks hold heat and at night they, they retain the heat 
and uh, it's going to stress your plants out. At night, the plants like to do their respiration, and that's the exchange of the gases of the carbon dioxide and the oxygen. When you're stressing your plants out at night because they cannot cool off, um, you're going to lose your plants, basically. So if you do decide to do rocks, use plants that you can find in seriscaping. There's several lavenders. There's some ornamental grasses, your manzanitas, your cacti. Now remember, cacti and succulents are different. So um, do, do your homework on that. Look for xeriscaping. Okay. Uh, also remember that rocks, that radiant heat is going to go right towards your house along with the reflection. So if you use rocks, just really keep the, the heat factor in mind. And last but not least, grass cycling. I love this picture. Grass cycling and thatch are going to be two different things. Grass cycling is when you don't have a, a weed seeds on your lawn, you mow your lawn, you leave what you just mowed on your grass. And that those nutrients will break down and decompose. Uh, you won't need to be feeding your grass when you do this. Um, there was a study done, and I wish I could remember the exact figure, where it says that when, if you do that once a month, that you will not need to fertilize your, your lawn every quarter. Um, and it's more detail than that. But anyway, it's something good to keep, keep in mind. You're keeping your lawn out of the green waste. Um, but and most importantly, it does not cause thatch. Thatch is um, real common in this area because we have the clay soil. And you know how the water sits on top of your clay soil? Thatch is caused by the rotted um, stems and the roots that are kind of, they're, they're slow to decompose because they're sitting in that water. So um, thatching is completely different. Please do grass cycling. It, it, I, we do it and it works beautifully. And that is it for mulching. Kathy, you want to come back over? Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody have questions for yeah, us? Yeah, we do have some questions. Thank you so much, ladies. That was fabulous. Um, Kathy has a question about her farm animals. She says that her farm animals get all of her food scraps. And will she be able to correct the composition of her compost pile without food scraps? Yes, you can. There's a lot of things that um, provide nitrogen for your um, comp compost bin without adding food scraps. Mm -hmm. You can add grass grass clippings. You can anything green that you've trimmed from the trees. Um, coffee grounds are a great source. And that mm -hmm. manure from your animals can be used in the compost bin. Manure should always be composted before they are used. So adding that manure into the compost bin is a great way to recycle that. Perfect, thank you. Linda um, also had a couple of questions. She says that Recology Service in rural Granite Bay does not offer green waste disposal and she'd like to know why. Um, we made a phone call for you, Linda, and the person at Recology did not uh, know the answer, but they were gonna have uh, somebody else try to give us a call back. I can also tell you that up here in Christian Valley in Auburn, um, we have one big bin and uh, no specific green waste. And um, I also wondered why, and we do put limited green waste into our one big bin because it didn't say don't. <laughs> so. We um, limited green waste going into ours, but we're um, going to try to get an answer for you from that, from Recology. And then she also, Linda, would like to know where she can purchase rice straw. You can purchase that at any animal farm store, feed store. Okay. Anything else that you get it at? Um, I, I do use rice straw as a mulch, and I, if you're in the Auburn area, I have purchased it at... Um, I think it's Echo Valley on Nevada Street. It just happens to be the one place that I go by. And then she'd also like to know what's the difference between our basic earthworm, earthworms and red wigglers? Oh, oh I can answer that. Question. Red wigglers live in the first four to six inches of your, of your soil. 
They are strictly a, a composting worm. Earthworms live vertically in the soil and they are not decomposers. I mean, they will break down things a little bit, but red wigglers are strictly a, 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 a composting worm. Okay, so to that, she asks whether or not she could go ahead and add red wigglers for faster composting. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and let me see if we have anything else. So when we do have an answer from Recology, we will go ahead and post that answer um, to our uh, website regarding the not being available to do uh, green waste. Let's see, is there anything else here? Where do you buy red wigglers? Um, well, we need to do a, a, a vermiculture workshop. You can <laughs> buy them, um, boy, you buy them online. You can buy them at the Green Acres. Uh, the local, our local supplier over here in Antelope is, is closed down. Um, there's a place in Galt, I don't remember what it's called, but yeah, I would, right now, I would probably just go to the local nurseries and get them until we have a, another local supplier to recommend. Okay. You can also buy them at um, uh, bait stores because red wigglers are also sold as fishing bait. So when you go, you know, you want to buy red wigglers, not night crawlers. Okay. And we also, Peggy also talked about uh, Peaceful Valley. Yeah. Yes. And am I seeing anything else here? Oh, well, back up here. Somebody would like to know about keyholes. Hold on. Keyhole gardens, I'm trying to get here. Do we have anyone knowledgeable about keyhole gardens, which she is starting? Do you ladies know about keyhole? I, I, I would submit that question to our website. There's a um, a place where you can ask a master gardener question. It'll go to our hotline and that can be researched. Great, perfect. Anything else? Should we wrap it up? I'm just scrolling through these, making sure that the questions are all done. That looks like it. You guys did a great job and I'd like to thank um, our participants for joining us today. We really appreciate, yeah, yay. We really appreciate that you are hanging in here with us uh, doing our Zoom meetings. And let me assure you that all of us master gardeners can hardly wait until the COVID is done and we can all get together face to face. We um, really appreciate uh, you coming to our workshops and we um, just really enjoy seeing you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So thank you for hanging in there with us. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. Awesome question. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>